Head to GatorsBreakdown.SupportingCast.FM to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining me right here on this Monday edition, of course, is co-host Will Miles. You can find him at his site, readandreaction.com, on YouTube at readandreaction.com. On Twitter at Will Miles SEC. Well, I don't, think, I don't think we have anything to talk about. I think it's 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 all been discussed. No, <laughs> Nothing's no, happened. No, no, Nothing at no, all. No news. No news whatsoever uh, to discuss here. Uh, man, just just when I thought apathy might be settling in just a little bit, Will. No, no. You know, Gator Nation comes through once again. Uh, team didn't come through Saturday night in a collapse in Columbia. Uh, you know, not fun when you're freezing and watching your team get their brains beat in, but, uh, you know, that, that comes with the territory sometimes. But, uh, you know, so a shellacking in Columbia Saturday leads to dismissals on Sunday. And, of course, we'll get into all that. I'll get into Dan Mullen's uh, press conference on Monday, too, and uh, some other uh, thoughts there. Update on Anthony Richardson as well. That that kind of – that news seems to be fluttering – left and right and up and down. So, we'll, you know, we'll get into it just a bit here with uh, some weird injury there for AR uh, heading into this week preparing for uh, Samford. So, Will, it got ugly Saturday, some elation on Sunday, and then an explanation today from Dan Mullen. Yeah, I did. You know, never a dull moment. There was never a better time for that moniker than this weekend. I figured, oh, South Carolina, you know, whatever. They win close. They win big. It's a pretty easy weekend to sort of put some stuff together. You know, I'll spend Sunday with my family, and then all of a sudden, whoa, all right. Like, there's some stuff to write about. There's some reckoning to happen. And and then I got to criticize you a little bit here, Dave. It was like 45 mm-hmm. degrees. It wasn't that cold. Come on, man. Like It was 45 wear, and windy, Will. Shut wear, up. Wear, a, wear a jacket and like a hat and you know some earmuffs or something and yeah and you know shake it off buddy come on i know you're skinny not like me so i do have natural protection but uh you know i got too much florida in me will it was not it was not it was not pretty uh long sleeve shirt uh a sweater and then a jacket to go over that i was i was comfy for the most part but uh, oh man i I would not win would ramp up it was it was it got it, it would cut through you a little bit I went to a game at Virginia Tech one time when it was like nine degrees. It was so <laughs> cold. I can't, you know, 45. I'm like, ah, child's play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we looked out on no rain. Friday, we're driving up there, and rain was supposed to be in the forecast. I'm like, man, come on. It was like two years ago I went up there, and it was cold and rainy. And now we thought we were getting it again. But, you, well, you could tell, man, The um, I think it probably played a part into it. too. You could tell the players didn't want to be in that cold weather either. Well, players didn't look like they wanted to be anywhere near <laughs> that true. field, to be honest yeah. with you. And, and uh, you know, if it had – normally I would say that if it had rained, that would have been to Florida's advantage. But considering yeah. they got blown off the ball yet again um, on, on defense, I would say that, uh, you know, there wasn't anything that was stopping that loss. And mm-hmm. that, that was just a butt kicking. And, you know, it's one of those things where – you know, when Florida loses and they lose close, you and I both hear from people, sometimes people who are relatively close to the program, sometimes people who give quite a bit of money to the program, and they'll be kind of disappointed. I've never heard anything like I heard. Third mm-hmm. quarter of that game against South Carolina, really halftime, kind of after Emory Jones fumble got returned yeah. for a touchdown is when it started. And people who love the Gators, who bleed orange and blue, who are saying, I'm sorry, you have to watch the second half, I'm out. Like I yeah. had three people message me that like, I'm sorry, you have to watch the second half. I can't do it. And they just bailed. And that's, um, you know, it, it, that's indicative. You know, you sort of mentioned that, that I think people care because we've seen that in the responses to the different things that we've written and the different recordings that we put out there, people absolutely care. But at the end of the day, if, if the players are going to go out and play like that, and if the coaches aren't going to put them in a position to succeed, there is going to be a level of apathy that, that, 
comes up on game day. And I'm, I'm curious to see, particularly with it, Samford this week, um, the level of support. I hope people will go out and support the players. It's an excellent opportunity if you live in Gainesville to pick up cheap tickets and take a kid yeah. that you wouldn't normally take to a game. So, you know, it's a great opportunity probably to take people to a game that you wouldn't normally take. And that, that'd that be the opportunity I take. My sons already, my two sons actually are now asking to go to the Florida State game. So it may end up being like a trip to Legoland or something when I take them both to the <laughs> swamp in, in November. All right, all right. Well, so yeah, there we go. We'll get into the get into it and the fallout from that ugly performance there uh, in South Carolina. Um, if you're hitting, if you're watching YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Really helps us out. And check us out on all your favorite podcast platforms if you're on the go. Well, what's your thoughts, man? Uh, did you think these firings uh, would come of uh, Todd Grantham, John Hevesy? You know, Don, Dan Mullen spoke about it today. We'll get into his comments coming up here. Uh, but you know, ugly performance Saturday um, in the trenches. Like you said, you got beat up there. Uh, Florida got beat up in the trenches. Uh, so on, on both sides, so that, of course, speaks to offensive line coach John Hevesy, also to defensive coordinator Todd Grantham, and uh, the move was made. And, Will, we, you and I spoke plenty, uh, of course, getting rid of Grantham after 2020, but also signifying that the move was going to be made uh, once you saw this defense come out this year, and even before the season, we was like, this is Todd Ransom's last year. We, we, we kind of knew it along the way uh, one year too late. And for that's probably the, the theme and the message I got most from the fan base is, hey, great, too little, too late. You know, you've lost me already. Todd Grantham has lost me already. This program's lost me already by waiting to make this move. So, yay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> throw confetti up in the air with your hand just a little bit. Yay. Um, so, in a way, fell on I won't, maybe deaf ears a little bit, maybe some un- uninterested Gator fans, but too little, too late. Coming after you know the the is that is that really was that really a final straw? And we'll get into Mullen's thoughts here, but you know that the South Carolina really that 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 was the final straw. That that that's what did it. And uh, but I was surprised to see John Hevesy's name included in a mid-season firing, given the history, given the twenty twenty-one year coaching resume these two te- these two coaches had together in Dan Mullen and John Hevesy. Um right move. I think we've seen the offensive line play the last few years. Florida needs a, an infusion there of talent and, and and development at this point of uh Dan Mullen's tenure. Still surprised that uh, that move was in the report uh that came out Sunday that included Todd Grantham, but of course the surprise of John Hevesy. Yeah, I mean, so look, I think none of us are going to going to weep endlessly at the departures yeah. of Todd Grantham and John Havasey. I mean, you know, you thank them for what they've given to the program and you say, hey, it's time to move on. And, and like you said, it's probably been time to move on for a while. My real impression, or at least my thought, is that whenever you think about numbers, whenever you think about analytics, the real thing that you're looking at is are you using the right processes to make decisions? That's why we believe in numbers. That's why we look at numbers because we want to use the data and and part of the process of making good decisions is having the data to then justify those decisions and make good decisions. So the issue that I have with this is that it indicates that the decision-making process is flawed, right? Because if you looked at the, there was plenty of data that suggested that these changes needed to be made at the end of last year, and that was ignored. And then there was plenty of data that suggested that this change needed to be made after the LSU game, and that was ignored. And so, like you said, to believe that this was the last straw, what it really indicates to me, and again, you're closer to the program than I am, but what it indicates to me is that Mullen didn't want to make the change and he got his arm twisted and, and had to make the change. And, you know, for all the people who have had criticisms of Mullen that he isn't the CEO, that he isn't the guy who's going to make the tough decision, that he that he is loyal to his friends to a fault, which in many cases is a good thing. But in this case, I think the what it says is that the loyalty overcame the decision-making process. And that's an issue when you're now entrusting Mullen to now make the right decisions to build the program back to where it needs to be uh, and back to where people expect it to be. So that was sort of my, my big impression is it's not necessarily too little too late. It's, it's that the, it indicates that the decision-making matrices that are being used to make these sorts of decisions 
is flawed. And that makes me start thinking about all the other decision-making matrices that are within the organization, whether it be recruiting, whether it be game planning, whether it be who starts and who sits, whether it be discipline, you know, all those different things. You, you start taking another look at them because you already know that loyalty seems to trump the things that are um, from a data perspective, relatively obvious. Yeah. Good points there, Will. And I, uh... We, as you said, we saw it coming. A lot of what we look at and how we look at this thing, it, it needed to be made. The change to be made, finally made uh, there. So you got my thoughts on uh, that, my episode of Gators Breakdown, uh, kind of the breaking instant reaction type of episode. A lot of my thoughts there. And also this morning on Twitter spaces, the fan base was fired up this morning, Will, on the, on the Twitter spaces. So a lot of good fun uh, had there. So glad to get the, the fan interaction on, on that side of it. So, of course, the Monday um, after the announcement comes on Sunday, game Saturday night, announcement on Sunday, and then Dan Mullen speaks to the media for the first time in person uh, since the 2019 season. Uh, Will so no no press conference for old Dave here. You know, the, the, I was able to take advantage of the of the Zoom and uh, and the COVID world of press conferences, and uh, didn't have to drive you know from Jacksonville to Gainesville for a, a 30 minute press conference. We'll see what the future holds in in that regard. Uh, the SEC teleconference there on the middle of the week because I could call into that, of course, and, and get my questions in there. But um, now in person, uh, the, the Monday Mullen press conferences. So maybe one day uh, I'll get back in there. Uh, maybe the, you know, the station, I, I can travel uh, through that. But uh, it's where it stands right now. So after the, the fallout of last week, that's where we now stand uh, for Monday press conferences here. So, so we did get to hear uh, from Dan Mullen, and we'll we'll get to hear from Dan Mullen now and talking about why why the move, why why not wait to the end of the season uh, to to make this move of getting rid of Todd Grantham and John Hefferson. It's always hard because you know you have uh, those guys are, are you know uh, friends of mine. I have a lot of respect for them. Both excellent football coaches. Um, but it is, you know, I mean, my, my responsibility as the head coach is to do what's best and what I feel is best for the Florida Gators. Uh, and that, that comes above it all. And, and so uh, it was obviously a really tough decision to make. Uh, you know, it was something that was weighing on me. It was something that I uh, was looking and saying, hey, there's, you know, I, I think it hit. This is, I'm probably going to make changes at the end of the season. And I thought, you know what, for the health of the program, for the health of everybody, and if you know you're going to do it, we're going to uh, l- let's make that move now and, and get us headed in the direction we're going into into the future. With where we were playing, I looked at look at how we played Saturday and, and some things that built up to it of, you know, we weren't where we needed to be. You know, one of the ways you look, say, it's a successful season is are you a better team at the end of the year than you were at the beginning of the year? Um, you know, and so for me, one thing, looking at where we're at right now, we're, we're, we're not better than we were earlier in the year. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're worse than we were earlier in the year. Uh, so at, at that point, I looked and I said, hey, we, we got to make some changes. Uh, with what we what we're doing, with where we're at, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I, I think part of that of the to do that and moving forward in the direction that we were going to go within the program moving forward, uh, that's the decision I made for those guys. We'll start looking for people for replacements moving forward. The hard part for me has been our inconsistencies throughout the year. You know, there's time we play. I think Todd's an uh, an excellent excellent football coach there's times we've played great defense we just haven't done it consistently uh you know i think the right we're one of the top rushing teams in the country and but we just haven't been consistent consistent will i mean there's a, a theme and a word we've put out there uh plenty of times uh so there you know i mentioned earlier it was this the game that you know broke the camel's back here no, I mean Dan Mullen sits here and tells us, okay, this this move has been weighing on my mind. You know, the South Carolina game was, I guess, you, maybe was the final straw just to speed it up. But the decision sounds like from Dan Mullen to get rid of Todd Grantham and John Hevesy was already there, uh, and now Saturday night performance comes and the moves are made the very next day. Uh, you know, that ugly performance. You know, something something needed to happen there. Um, so. And Dan Mullen mentioning the inconsistency, and also will to extend that. I'll extend another soundbite he had. Uh, inconsistency also in the preparation. Uh, he said, "Quote: I thought the energy was fine. I thought it was really good." Mullen said, "I thought our effort was good. I thought our mental approach to the game was good. One of the things, and the biggest challenge for us right now, is we've got to figure out how the Monday to Friday team 
shows up on Saturday. They're not matched. So, and I've heard reports of you know practice being good, not coming, not not showing up on Saturday uh, there. So, whatever these coaches are teaching these players, whatever they're developing these players, whatever the game plan is all the week, there's a lot of confidence in that Monday through Friday. But they get to the field, and it doesn't translate. And is the, the messaging from the coast? Is the messaging from the coach? Uh, is it um, you know the, the mental approach from the coaches and, and, and the players here? Seems like there's some confidence in what they're doing Monday through Friday, and Mullen just can't figure out why it's not showing up on Saturday. Yeah, I gotta be honest, man. If if you spend five days at practice and then can't figure out why it's not translating, then maybe what you're doing at practice isn't all that great. I, I that that, and then they asked him like, you know, what happened against South Carolina, and he basically said, I don't know. And so I think he took a tone today that people actually liked and appreciated during the press conference, but the answers were a little bit disturbing. I mean, you're sitting there going, we don't know how we're going to fix this. We don't know why our guys show up on Thursday and, and fired up and ready to go and then lay an egg on Saturday. That that's, um, I I don't know what to say about that. I just look at it and go. and, And then the, the quote that you had in there where he talks about, are you a better team today than you were, at the beginning yeah. of the season, the answer is no. Well, that logic can be naturally extended to, to the head coach pretty easily. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, on my way home today, I was listening to the press conference about him talking about Monday to Friday. I was like, oh, my God, people are going to start calling him like midweek Mullen or something. Where it's just you know, <laughs> I don't know what's going to. So, look, I, I think um, the changes needed to be made, but the changes, the fact that he's been mulling them for a while is indicative that, again, I go back to the decision-making process. Like, you know, if you're dating somebody and you're thinking about whether you should break up with Mm. them, it's time to break up with them. That's the reality. And so, you know, you, you, decisions are hard. Breaking up with people is hard. Relationships and managing those relationships Mm -hmm. is hard. And so, you know, I'm not saying that I'm without sympathy or empathy for the people who have to do that. But what I am saying is, is that, it's almost unfair to people like Todd Grantham and John Hevesy to let them twist out in the wind for multiple weeks. If you're, um, if you're not fully behind them 100%. And I suspect that the players can sense that, right? That if you're questioning it, if you're not defending them, if you're not coming out forcefully and saying they'll be here till the end of the year, you know, focus starts to drift and you sit there and go, well, I don't even know if Grantham's going to be here next week because if we play like crap, they're going to get rid of him. And then you play like garbage against LSU and he's still there. You're like, well, I guess I need to go back to work. (laughs) And you know, these guys look, I mean, when you're a football player, one, Mullen mentioned it today. You're a competitor. You love the game. But the other thing is these guys have to put stuff on tape that's going to get them paid. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think anybody goes out there and tries to lay an egg on purpose. But I do think that there are natural motivating factors. Right. And that if you have significant respect for your coach and you have um, – and you want to – Um, and you want to fight for him, then that will show up. And maybe that's the switch that kind of flipped against South Carolina is it became pretty clear that, that Grantham and Hevesy were not galvanizing forces who were going to get these guys to play for them in the way maybe Ed Orgeron did when LSU took on Florida, but instead um, that it was actually hindering that sort of performance. And if you remove them, then that would be the case. But, you know, Neil Blackman also had an article on Saturday down South today. Um, Again, I don't know the sources. I don't know what, but Neil doesn't put stuff out there for no reason and he said somebody from the florida staff contacted him and said this was the most toxic environment that they'd ever been in and so you know where was that toxicity coming from was it coming from grantham was it coming from hevesy or is it coming from mullen i think those are all questions or from someplace else i think those are all questions that at some point are going to need to be answered because you know the hope would be that you've changed the culture of the team by making these changes And that culture change is going to lead to a better result on the field. But, you know, we've been talking for three or four weeks now that words are words. And at the end of the day, the proof is what you show out on the field and what they showed out on the field against South Carolina was not all that great. And so, uh, you know, until they show it on the field, I'm not going to believe anything that I hear. Right. We thought the bunker mentality last week, the, you know, all in, let's worry about ourselves was going to make some kind of difference there. And it didn't, of course, team was battling with the flu as well, but that's not why we, we got a performance Saturday night. And we don't forget them. I and this is on the heels also of that athletic article last week. We're talking about the soft approach and the, the physicality of this team, mainly on the defense, but you know, it's, it's team wide, it's, it's system wide. And, and probably maybe we can start asking ourselves about uh, Nick Savage as well, because I mean, what, 
our biggest complaints and the two people who just got fired, a lot of that's physicality. A lot of the physicality on defense and the lack of tackling over the years. And now this offensive line who now for, you know, after a pretty good stretch at the beginning of the season, can't open, seem to open up any holes uh, for this, uh, for, for, for these running backs that, Running games uh, completely uh, falling by the wayside now at, at this point in the season. So, I mean, yeah, I think you you tie it all in together. And with that that article last week from the Athletic, that was pretty damning from a coaches coaches that in your peers that are really they're not afraid of Florida at all uh, right now. Uh, and the approach Florida brings to the table, and it, and it shows. And so, well, I, I guess you know the the question of why now. Uh, you know, for, for the for the fan base, you know, should have been done before. Yes, is there any benefit, Will, in your opinion, of of, of doing this now? I guess from a player, uh, uh, you kind of just spoke on it now. If the, if if you if these coaches' words are falling on deaf ears, you know, they're not getting through to the players. Now, look, we can talk about the scheme as much as we want to with Todd Grantham and how much we didn't like it, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe the Going back to Mamu Diabate's comments of the, the scheme versus the LSU, and, and I believe in my teammates, never once spoke to the coach, never once spoke to the, the scheme that they were playing in. He believed in his players that he was out there on the field with. I mean, there, that probably was a good sign right there that, you know, no, there's not a lot of belief in this coaching staff. There's not a lot of belief in what I'm being asked to go out there and do, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So we, look, we've known the change was – needing and going to be made but now once you started getting that type of messaging from from, from Diabate now you kind of move forward to the South Carolina game and what we saw there I mean if there's not a lot of belief if there's not a lot of, and Mullen, I think Mullen even said it today if there's not a lot of confidence in what they're being asked to do then these type of performances that we saw Saturday night are going to happen there's not to me there, to me there's not a lot of confidence in these guys and really going back to Diabate's comments about that yeah, you asked me whether I think that the timing um, – I can't remember exactly what you asked me, but basically, do, do I think that the timing is is good or do I think that the timing makes sense? I think the question is for whom, right? Yeah. I think that if the players have tuned out Grantham, if the players have tuned out Hevesy, then the timing makes sense because the reality is, is that you need to make sure that your players are in lockstep with the coaches. If the answer is, I mean, I sort of look at it and say, for Mullen, I think this is actually excellent timing, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the ire is going to calm down, not because there isn't a segment of the fan base that thinks that maybe Florida needs to move on, but because they recognize that Florida isn't going to move on, that this move is an indication that Mullen is going to get 2022 regardless of what anybody thinks because you don't make this move now if you're going to give him 2022. Now, maybe if you go out and you lose a couple more games, things change, but this is the type of move you make when you're giving somebody a second opportunity, not the kind of move that you make when you're getting ready to clean house. And so, um, you know, is there some desperation in there and maybe they'll still clean house? Sure. That's always a possibility, but at the end of the day, the timing in this case is really in my mind. So it's a, it's a sacrificial lamb, to quiet down the people who just wanted something to be done because that's something that people are starting to want to be done. I mean, you and I have, have publicly come out and said, you know, I think it's time to move on Mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, turning this into a national championship level program under Dan Mullen with everything that's gone on thus far is going to be very, very difficult. And so if you're already looking at that uphill battle, you're already looking at that risk profile of what it's going to take to move the program in that direction, then you say, maybe it does make sense to make a change. That doesn't mean we won't support the program. That doesn't mean we won't right. be honest when we're when we're assessing what's going on. But I think well, we need to come many, into this. How many times did I try to talk myself into Todd Grantham this past offseason? <laughs> More than me, more than me. Yeah. That's for you sure. You brought me back down that. to earth like a month before the season. So, <laughs> uh, you know, look, I, I think I think two things can be true at one time. I think that Dan Mullen's statement today about how you know the South Carolina game is the first game all year where um, you know where Florida didn't have a shot. I think was sort of the way he phrased it, or where yeah. if yeah. you know if they hadn't had catastrophic things that had gone against them, that they might have been able to get a win. Um, I think that's true, right? I mean, now the Georgia game, I think you could make some arguments about, but I think for the most part, that's true. At the same time, and then he talked about close games, and that's something else that Mm -hmm. I've brought up repeatedly, that he was very good in close games early on and hasn't been good in close games since. So that's true, right? I mean, you look at that and say, okay, 
Um, I can understand that. And if I believe that the processes that were being used were sound, then I would be fully on board with moving forward and dismissing those sorts of things. The problem is that these skeletons in the closet that keep popping out at us just keep, just keep pointing towards poor processes, right? I mean, you know, the Grantham and Hevesy firings after this game rather than earlier in the season or rather than last year. You look at the decision between Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson in terms of what seems clear, and especially considering all the praises that Mullen sung for Anthony Richardson during the offseason and during fall camp. And then, you know, you just sort of build you just sort of build those things up and all of a sudden you're like and all the recruiting, right? The process is there. So these st- things start to build up and you go, that's an awful large mountain that you have to climb. Is it worth trying to climb that mountain again or do you climb with somebody else? I think I understand where people are coming from when they say they want to make a change. And and I, I am concerned when the head coach gets up and says, I don't know how we went out and put a performance like that together when Monday through Friday, everything was great because either that means that the evaluation on Monday through Friday is flawed or the players decided to make a statement when they got out on the field because they didn't like the way things were running. And again, that points to poor process. If your players are that unhappy and we saw the same thing, right? There were a couple of players who, who tweeted out some things after the dismissals that indicated they were happy with the decision. I'm sure those have been deleted by now, but that kind of environment, that kind of culture is, is problematic. It's, it's, you know, the question from here on out is going to be, is everybody moving in the same direction? And well, there you go. I, I mean, that's what Mullen basically said. You know, this was for a this was for a head start. You know, this was to get started on bringing the next people in here. I mean, he, he even come out and said, you know, they're going to be searching, and you know, they'll, they'll they'll have some guys they identify. No announcements before the end of the season, but you know, no, he didn't shy away from. And as you said, mentioning the future that you know this these moves kind of signify that Dan Mullen will be the head coach in 2022 as the way it stands right now. And mentioning that, you know, this is for a head start to get started on finding the next guys. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think obviously at four and five, everybody's unhappy. If you end up seven and five, you win a bowl game and everything sort of turns around with the dismissal of these two guys. I think we all feel a little bit different at the end of January or at the you know beginning of January after a bowl game. If things have completely turned around and all of a sudden you got new young guys in there playing on the offensive line and the defensive side of the ball and things are looking up and improving. Will that happen or not? I don't know. I, I think, you know, you, you talk about apathy with the fan base, with the boosters, those sorts of things. I actually don't think it's an in-season apathy you got to worry about. I think it's the off-season apathy you got to worry about because all the all the booster events, all the coach going mm-hmm. around and building up the fan base, all the fundraising, all that sort of stuff happens between February and August. And and that's when it's going to be tough because there's there are going to be segments of very devoted Gators who spend an awful lot of money on the program who go to those events where Dan Mullen goes and tries to sort of build enthusiasm and all that sort of stuff. And it's going to be kind of uphill, uphill sailing there for a little while in some of those meetings, I'm sure. And it's going to be interesting to see how he handles that because obviously when you've questioned him, when other reporters have questioned him, he hasn't really excelled in that particular scenario. So I'm interested to see what happens this off season, how he's able to handle some of the questions. Cause I'll be honest when you, when you don't have to, there are people who will ask questions in a much more pointed fashion than some of us will, um, you know, because mm-hmm. professionalism is not always uh, is, is not a prerequisite to ask a question at a booster meeting. <laughs> that's true. That's true. It is fun when those fans get to ask questions sometimes. Absolutely. And, yeah. and when he got to do those type of events, it was 2018 and 2019 when everything was on the up and up. And as you're saying now, with COVID protocols and all that, he hasn't necessarily got a chance to speak to the fan base like uh, he did back then. And um, we'll see but if man, it opens up. Maybe he doesn't even open it up because of the status of uh, where he's at as head coach right now. Yeah, well, here's the problem is nobody's asking me how should Mullen fix this. They're asking, yeah. should he be given an opportunity to fix this? Yeah. And those are very different questions. And I am getting that second question over and over yes. and over again. And I haven't gotten the first question in about a month. And yeah. so, you know, that the course of four weeks, the loss to LSU, the loss to Georgia, the loss to South Carolina has completely shifted the narrative in terms of whose fault it is and adjustments and, you know, making changes and those sorts of things. You know, the, well, they're, they're the, sweeping changes either way. It's either sweeping changes with the complete staff or it's Dan Mullen making sweeping changes. The sweeping changes are happening either way or should yeah. be happening either way. 
well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, you know, so I am happy that they have made staff changes. I think that they make sense. Yeah. But I think they need to make culture changes based on everything yes. that we're hearing thus far. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of that coming up too. And the culture changes are going to have to be tied into accountability. They're going to have to be tied into personal responsibility. They have to be tied into playing time. They're going to be tied into everybody rowing in the same direction. And up until now, I mean, you don't go four and five. You don't lose to South Carolina like that if everybody's rowing in the same direction. And I thought it was really interesting that during his press conference, Mullen said that he thought his players brought great effort, but they didn't bring great toughness. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure... Yeah, that wouldn't go over well with me in the locker room yeah. where my coach yeah. basically just called me soft. And I know he did it at a nice conciliatory tone and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we we'll just add him to the we we'll just add him to the list of SEC head East head coaches who think that. <laughs> well, that is one way to think of it, I suppose. Um, so we'll see. Right. I mean, maybe it's a shot across the bow. Maybe it's yeah. a, I got rid of the guy you guys all said is the challenge. I got rid of the guys that you guys all said were holding you back. I just said to everybody, you've given great effort, and I just said you weren't all that tough. So show me how tough you are, and maybe that's the approach that he's taking. But uh, to me, those things are tied in, right? That if you give, yes, that if you're, right. that if you're a Division One football player, you're a tough, tough dude. And so if you go out there and give great effort, that toughness should come through. The idea that the great effort was given, but that the toughness wasn't there, I think is probably there. There's a discontinuity there that, uh, that I struggle with, but you know, again, we'll see, right. I mean, we'll see the, the, but the reality is, is that the sweeping changes to me, the athletic article, the stuff Neil wrote today, it, it, it indicates that there are cultural changes that need to take place. And let's be honest, we've all worked in organizations that were less than ideal. And when a culture was toxic, it wasn't usually the middle managers who were promoting that, that toxic culture. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, that was my biggest question for kind of uh, making the, the big change is because I'm not sure how you get that culture back. So that's kind of you know, where, where I stood in uh, my uh, post game uh, South Carolina episode there. All right. Well, we'll get into more Dan Mullen and what he had to say today, but here we go. Betting time, and more is always better, and that's why my bookie instantly doubles all first-time deposits. With double the funds, you can double your action, and more importantly, double your wins. Getting in on the action has never been easier. I can bet with all my favorite currencies, including crypto, and with all that extra scratch, raw not get in on the biggest matchups of the week at my bookie. As we inch closer to the NFL playoffs, there are some pivotal games to be on the lookout for coming up, including a showdown between division rivals, San Francisco 49ers and the Los Angeles Rams. Rams there with MVP candidate Matt Stafford uh, looking to continue rolling along against that tough 49er defense. Will you bet the Rams will cover the spread? If you want to, don't wait. Head to my bookie today. Redeem your double deposit bonus so you can get in on the game. Start winning now. Use my promo code Gators to receive double your first deposit instantly. That's promo code Gators so you can double your funds to double your winnings. Bet anything, anywhere, anytime with my bookie. I will right, let's get into one more soundbite here uh, from, from, from Dan Mullen and was asked, Will, because you and I have had this conversation. Uh, I know Bob Redman from 24-7 was the first one to put it out there. Uh, but was Dan Mullen under any pressure? to make these changes. I, I will say this, Scott. I mean, our administration here does an unbelievable job. The support they give us, uh, that, you know, I mean, they're Scott. I mean, I, I have a, a, a great working relationship with Scott. Um, and, you know, and you look at what we're doing right now. I mean, for us, I mean, the, the work we're putting in, it obviously would love everything to be extremely accelerated where we have a facility like every, like most teams in the country that, you know, we build up and we get kind of caught up to where, where everybody is in college football. Uh, you know, but I, you know, Scott's tirelessly working on that, the support they give for that. And, um, you know, he was there. It was certainly something I discussed with him, uh, and we had discussions about, um, you know, so I think he, he was certainly involved in it, but it certainly wasn't any pressure. The decision was mine. So Dan Mullen says the decision was his, and that comes off the, the report there from uh, Swamp 24-7's Bob Redman of a, a shouting match in the tunnel there of williams Bryce Stadium in Columbia. Uh, basically, the, the basis of that was changes have to happen. Uh, and a day later, we get those changes. Uh, so, you know, um, don't necessarily know 
how much pressure, but I'm sure the message was conveyed that uh, what was put out there on the field Saturday night is not acceptable. Something needs to be done. And I don't think it's any coincidence that there were some moves made on Sunday. But now, we'll, I mean, and we know, I think, that the relationship is Scott, Shruck, Scott Strickland trusts Dan Mullen. I mean, there is a working history with those guys. They have a reputation uh, there together. Scott Strickland lets Dan Mullen handle the football program. But at times, he needs to be a boss. I mean, he may not get paid as much as Dan Mullen, but he's still the boss. <laughs> that's, that's one of the weird things in college football is uh, how, how the coaches make more, uh, you know, the, 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 than the boss man who, who can make the ultimate call there of what needs to happen uh, in, in a program. But Dan Mullen says the decision was his, Will. Yeah, I'm not sure that I believe that. Um We'll see. I mean, great. You get to own it. It's your decision. And if the next guy who comes in doesn't do a good job, I'm sure you'll be, uh, you'll be, either, uh, depending on how the next guy does, you'll either be lauded or you'll be pilloried. And that's sort of the way it is as the head coach. At the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's his decision from the standpoint of if he, if, if Strickland demanded it, it, it would have been a, <laughs> it would have been a make the choice <laughs> or I'm going to make the choice for you. Yeah. And making the choice for you would have included, you know, looking for a new head coach as well. And maybe that's, right. you know, at the end of the day, it was the head coach's decision. Semantics, Will, semantics. <laughs> I don't know. I got to say, it seemed a little bit of a shot across the bow there. I had missed this when I watched it earlier, but the the bit about the facilities and how mm. we're behind every other program in college football, um, that that's not – Again, I, I'm sure meant nothing by it. I'm sure I'm reading more into it than I should. But that that that's an interesting comment that I hadn't really picked up on when I listened to it earlier, but certainly does sort of point towards, um, you know, we, we heard those sort of rumblings from Jim McElwain. We heard that people behind the scenes weren't happy that he made noise about the facilities and how the facilities weren't, weren't maybe at the same capacity as Alabama or Clemson or Georgia or those sorts of places. So I am curious how that's going to play with the people who, who uh, write the checks to get those facilities built because there's when McElwain was here, there was no doubt that Florida was behind and there were probably plans in place, but those plans hadn't been executed. At this point, the plans are underway. They're being executed to build those facilities. And so, um, you know, the idea that they're going to be behind isn't not for that much longer. And the other aspect of it is, is it does sort of sound like a, it's an excuse for the recruiting and the things that have been um, criticism points rather than, uh, rather than just saying, Hey, we're going to fix it. But again, I, I think, I, I take everything with a grain of salt. It's words. Yeah. At the end of the day, we'll know what happens based on wins and uh, not just wins against Sanford. So yeah, <laughs> right. Missouri and Florida State in the bowl yeah. game are coming up. But if they go 4-0 uh, for the rest of the year, I think we'll all look at this and say, you know, we don't need to parse words anymore. We don't need to look into what was meant by that comment or what was meant by that comment. But, you know, again, you sort of piece together the idea that there are comments about it being a toxic work environment, the idea that there are comments about – you know, or that there are reports of him and Strickland having a spirited conversation after the game yeah. against South Carolina, you know, and then all of a sudden you've got these changes and these changes weren't made before. Um, you know, at, at some point, I think it does sort of point back to that relationship is going to be strained at some point along the path. If, mm -hmm. uh, if there are edicts coming from the people who sign Strickland's checks that are making changes or that are facilitating so the ones paying for this, the ones paying for those facilities there you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm sitting there going, those are the people who are going to listen to that comment and yeah. their ears are going to perk up. Not people like me who, you know, if, if I stopped giving to the university, they'd be like, oh, we can get any other schlub to, to replace that money. <laughs> um, there are people who give millions of dollars to the university. And and uh, if that's seen as a slight, that will be a problem. But again, we'll see. You win. Nobody cares. Uh, Will, so, of course, all, all, all this weighs pretty heavy on being the head coach of the University of Florida. But Dan Mullen says he understands, Will, the responsibility of being the head man in charge. I'm the head coach, so it, I, I bear it, all of it. It's on my shoulders. You know, I'm the one that's responsible for this program. Uh, I'm the one that's responsible for this team uh, and how we go perform. And so, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's your job here as the head coach is to take on that responsibility. Uh, and my job is to make sure that we go perform and this team plays to the Gator standard, which we're not doing right now. And uh, so, you know, it's my responsibility to find a way to fix that. Well, soundbite right there. Uh, the fan base, you know, kind of 
came back around just a little bit from you know compared to some some of the other uh, press conferences that we've uh, heard from Dan Mullen you know this year last year as well and the word Gator Standard brought up again or the phrase Gator Standard brought up again and Mullen basically saying look I, I'm trying to remember the first time you know he, he said you know maybe get back to the Gator Standard or whatever but honestly you know pretty cut to the point right there you know we're, we're nowhere near it uh, right now it says that's our job to get back there uh, some some owning up right there I think a lot of the fan base had wanted that a couple of times uh, th- th- this year in other situations. And he did there. Uh, so there he is, you know, taking, you know, taking responsibility from, you know, be- being asked, you know, where, where does this ultimately fall? Yeah. You can fire all the coaches you want, but it's still, it, it still starts with the head man. It still starts with Dan Mullen. And this is on him. This is on him. And this, you know, th- these changes are on him. These differences are going to be on him now. And like you said earlier, they have to pay off and we'll see what happens here. But, Owning up to the uh, responsibility of being the Florida Gator head coach here, Will. Yeah, I mean, look, it's great to hear that that you know he recognizes that that game is not a an acceptable <laughs> an acceptable <laughs> way for the program to look, and I'm sure he doesn't need to be told that. I'm sure he's disappointed, right? I mean, I can't imagine anybody goes out there and wants the organization to struggle like that, wants the team to struggle like that. At the same time, there are. Um, you know, there are steps that need to be taken to get from where we are today and where we need to be and outlining those steps proved to be a difficult, um, a difficult thing. And part of it is, is I'm not sure he necessarily knows what those steps are. Right. And part of that is going to be rebuilding the trust and the culture within the program. Now that you have Todd Grantham and John Havasey gone. So, you know, it's not any easier next year. I mean, you've got Utah on the Mm -mm. schedule to open things up, then Kentucky, you go at Tennessee and Tennessee looks a lot better with Josh Heupel there in charge. LSU is going to have a new coach. And so they're going to be building something. They obviously have a lot of talent. Georgia's still on the schedule, Texas A&M, and then Florida State to finish up the year. I mean, that's something that could get ugly really quickly if mm-hmm. these sorts of things don't get fixed. It's it's not as this is not one of those years where you look at the schedule and go, God, there's like, uh, is there even a game I really want to go to this year? Like, there is <laughs> that is not a problem this year. You got Utah coming to the swamp. You got Kentucky. You got Missouri, LSU. You got the game in Jacksonville, and I think a bunch of us might want to go to Kyle Field because A and M seems like a cool place to go when it's not the middle of a pandemic. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, he's setting the stage for 2022. He's setting the yeah. – he, there is a recognition that the buck now stops with Dan Mullen. I think everyone already want. I think fans want that to be the case. I think it needs to be the case. And at this point, you have – you know, I think people would have had grace for 2021 if Mullen had brought in a defensive coordinator and right. that defensive coordinator had struggled a little bit. And some of these games got dropped because of that. I think there would have been a lot more grace. The The reason the grace isn't there from the fan base is because we don't understand the decision-making process. And that, I think, is actually going to be Mullen's big challenge, not just from here on out, but also during the offseason, is describe the decision-making process and people will get on board. If you can't describe your decision-making process, then people are constantly going to be questioning your decisions. And, you know, because the decision-making process for keeping Grantham, for keeping Hevesy didn't make yeah, a lot uh, of sense. Well, yeah. And before you go in, yeah. I don't need to know what you caught, why, why you caught a certain play on third and six. And, you know, yeah, what you're, you know, what you're putting out here is, is big picture, you know, big picture was something, something that comes across to, to every fan in the stand, every fan watching the game. Well, the most important thing you can do as a CEO of an organization is cast vision, right? Yeah. You have to be able to cast a vision that everybody can buy into. Now, that's been a struggle for Mullen his entire time at Florida. I mean, he came out guns blazing saying, show up and then maybe we'll win, which wasn't maybe the best play, best way to get a bunch mm-hmm. of people on your side before you ever played a game. And and But then he goes out and he won. Right. And so Mm -hmm. you won a bunch of games. And when you win those games, you get to go out and you get to tell people, um, you know, you get you get to ask for things. You build up political capital over time by winning. And he was able to do that for a couple of years. Now, last year, he spent a lot of that political capital in the last three games of the year. And particularly, he spent that political capital against Oklahoma. But he even spent some of it in wins. Right. I mean, the Mm -hmm. the thing with Missouri, I don't think anybody really cared about the the costume he wore to the press conference, except for a few people. The thing they cared about was the fight that happened at the end of the first half where Mullen was out there um, not breaking it up, but was actually sort of instigating it in in some respects. That's where people got upset. The place people got upset is the show cause that you're already concerned about recruiting. And now your head coach can't go out and recruit because of recruiting violations that you committed. and, And 
Florida obviously is a very proud program and has a bunch of people who pride themselves on doing things the right way. Now we can argue then, whether or not they've always want, Zim doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> Uh, that too, but you know we can we can always we can argue about whether Florida has actually done things the right way, but they've never gotten caught doing it the wrong way since yeah. since, since the nineteen eighties, and and when you get caught that that's a problem, right? So um, anyway, I mean, look, I, I think at the end of the day, Dan Mullen himself has established the expectation, and the expectation is that the buck now stops with him, and so the challenge to me is going to be defining what that means for 2022 because all right you finish this season seven and five maybe even drop another one right you finish six and six and what does it look like in like what is an acceptable Mm -hmm. outcome for 2022 because i don't think nine and three is going to do it well do you even get nine do you even get to nine and three say you start one and two (laughs) well then so we're going to make decisions like usc I got, I got, there you go. There you I go. Gotta be I think honest, that's the Dave, situation it, I think Florida can put themselves in right now. I got to be honest, Dave. Unless you, unless there's a guy you're waiting for at the end of 2022, mm-hmm. that's bad decision making as well. If, if it's time to move on two games into next season, it's time. Well, we to said move that about now. USC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. That's what we said. You know, I, I don't want that to be this scenario. I really don't. Well, but that's that's a decision for that's a decision for Strickland to make. But but it's mm-hmm. one of those things where, you know, it's what I said earlier in the episode about Grantham and Hevesy. Like it's unfair to those guys to have them twisting in the wind when you know they're not the right person for the job. Yeah. And so it's the same thing for Mullen. If Scott Strickland looks at it and thinks he's not the right guy for the job, it's unfair to let him twist in the wind. The only way you let him twist in the wind is if you think getting rid of him two games in next year or at the end of the year next year is going to give you a shot at a transcendent coach who maybe isn't available right now. But you're the University of Florida. You should be able to go out and get that transcendent coach and pay him whatever he needs to come right now, as opposed to and, having and that to wait the, until next year to do and, it. And that works the other way too. I mean, if Dan Mullen doesn't want to be here, that needs to be clearly known as well. And I'm not saying he does or doesn't, but of course that's coming up. That's coming up a lot. And we just played the sound bite where it sounds like he wants to be here. If he wants to, he understands the responsibility. He is making moves for the future that he wants to be at Florida. But I can't help the narrative that's out there. Well, and I'm I'm not going to try to infer anything into yeah. Mullen's psyche. I don't know. What I can do is I can listen to his words. I can listen to the sentiment behind his words, and then I can evaluate how those words translate to the field. So if you think about last week, the words were, you know, that we are focused on that we're focused on South Carolina. We know we're facing a good South Carolina team. We're not giving people access to the media because we want everybody focused. And then the team came out completely unfocused. And so my evaluation of last week is that none of those words came to, fru- came to fruition. So this week, we'll see what the words are, right? The words today are, I want to be here. We're going to get this fixed. I'm not quite sure how. I don't know why things aren't translating from the weekend or from the, from the weekdays to the weekend. And, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, at the end of the day, the buck stops with him. That's his job. We're going to have to see. If practices really are good during the week, we're going to have to see it translate. Um, and it's going to have to translate against Missouri. It's going to have to translate against Florida State. It's going to have to translate in a bowl game. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I, again, I think it, <laughs> if it doesn't translate pretty soon, it's going to be a pretty obvious decision. Yeah. All right, we'll rapid fire to end these um, last couple of topics here. Uh, Christian Robinson now is going to take over. Original reports coming out that Wesley McGriff was going to take over. He's had some defensive coordinator experience before the new, uh, well, you know, safety coach that was brought in, DB coach that was brought in for Florida this year. But it did come out, Florida released on Monday morning that Christian Robinson would now be taking over uh, the play calling duties for Todd Grantham. Look, this is why him, I think, of course, came up. It didn't rub a lot of the fan base the right way because he is a Todd Grantham disciple and what's really going to change. Well, not there's not going to be a massive shift in this defense. You don't change scheme. You don't change uh, the, the, the base of the defense. You're not going to change that this late in the season, what these players know. Now, can you tinker it? Can you do what you think needs to be done well? Uh, but a lot of people don't feel great about that, him being a direct disciple uh, of Todd Grantham playing in this defense and now coaching in this defense. But look, the players know him. He knows the scheme in and out by playing in it, coaching in it for years. It is probably the right move here uh, as far as, you know, look at these players. They, they they know him. There's a relationship there. He knows these players as well, being around them for so long and for, and for so many years. So not a – 
I guess the only surprise was the initial report, it being Wesley McGriff, him having some experience, Christian Robinson not really having this experience. But Christian Robinson now taking over for Todd Granson for the rest of the year. Uh, thoughts on that, Will? Yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense, some of the things that you laid out. I think it it does sort of lead to some questions about the communication when you think about the reports that came out about McGriff and then it being Robinson afterwards. But at the end of the day, look, I mean, the – uh, the head coach needs to make the decision in terms of who's going to call those plays and it's gonna, and you're going to live and die by that. And at the end of the day, if things don't improve at all, then you can't really blame Grantham anymore because it's a guy who knows Grantham's defense, who's calling the plays. And maybe at that point you get better clarity around whose fault it really is. And if things all of a sudden turn around, well, okay, then, Hey, that was the right change. Same thing on the offensive line, right? I mean, if, if all of a sudden Florida's blowing guys off the ball again, next, next game, well, not next game, but two games from now, then it indicates that, you know, there really was a motivation and a culture issue, not a talent and, and, uh, you know, not a talent and technique issue. And so, you know, I don't know what the problem is. I think when you look at it, one of the things I said last time on Stand Up and Holler was was leadership is the thing that I think when you look at where things fall short and how you lose a game like that. I mean, you can point to turnovers, you can point to penalties, you can point to special teams, you can point to all those, you can point to the defense, you can point to the offense sputtering at times. But at the end of the day, the only way you can have something go wrong in all of those different areas is leadership. And so, um, you know, the leader of the team has decided Christian Robinson is going to call these, um, call these plays, call the defensive plays. And if the defense responds and, you know, he is, he is one of the best recruiters. So you think about in terms of the players and whether they like him and whether they respect him and all that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. they certainly mm-hmm. liked him, liked him and respect him enough to come to the school. And so if that's the case and he's been able to earn their, earn their respect and their trust, then it's an excellent choice. If it turns out that, uh, you know, he's just going to call the same blitzes from Mickinope over and over again, then the fan base is going to be happy. And, you know, chances are none of us will be blaming Grantham anymore. Yeah. A couple of changes there. Yeah. The, the blitz is from, you know, from when you're playing in South Carolina, the blitzes that were coming from North Carolina, we saw once again, uh, not, not working. You know, but that, that, and that's where a lot of this comes from for Christian Robinson. Of course, you, you go back, Will, to about a year ago and uh, Dan Mullen makes a pitch to get him to stay when Michigan's pursuing him. And it looks like that is almost a done deal, but Dan Mullen, you know, finds a way to, to keep Christian Robinson. Uh, but a lot of us, you know, also the the linebacker play, uh, and which has not been all that great at Florida the last, you know, few years. Uh, and a lot of guys playing out of position. Um, you got some young, more truer linebackers uh, on the roster, but the guys you're playing with right now who can go out there and contribute, not the true linebackers. And, and we're seeing that uh, week in and week out. And, you know, no, no – no fault for effort there. I think Mamadou Diabate is out there trying his hardest. It's just not a good fit there for Mamadou Diabate playing linebacker right now, Jeremiah Moon playing linebacker right now. We've seen some good things from Tyron Hopper. Uh, but now you wonder how that much, how much that changes of now Robinson having to spread his responsibilities to the entire defense. Uh, now Paul Pascaloni, I believe, Dan Mullen said, uh, would be on the field as, in, in a coaching role uh, to help out uh, Christian Robinson there as well. Uh, I was going to say, the good news is they have a cupcake to figure it out. So they'll have the opportunity to try some things. Simplify it. Simplify it. Well, I mean, whatever they decide to try, they'll have an opportunity to try it. And the repercussions of screw ups as they're trying to make those changes will be relatively limited. So one of the reasons you advocate or people advocate making changes during bye weeks is it gives you two weeks to sort of get all that stuff in order. And, you know, look, I all due respect to Samford. This is really what amounts to a bye week, yeah. but it's a bye week from the standpoint of you now can get your ducks in a row and you can go out and you can try it on the field, see what works, see what doesn't and make adjustments for the last three games of the year. So um, I think there'll be an opportunity to do that and we'll see. It'll be interesting to see what kind of changes are made when the Gators come out this weekend. And then obviously when they come out against Missouri. All right, Will, last one here, uh, last bullet point, uh, tease it there. Er, Anthony Richardson uh, just cannot stay healthy, and here's another uh, another in the line of um, injuries here for Anthony Richardson, hamstring, concussion. And now, Dan Mullen says, quote, he heard himself dancing at the hotel Friday night. Well, instead of Richardson, he was cleared to play Saturday, and now I don't know, we'll see. So, of course, a concussion uh, he suffered versus Georgia caused him to miss practice a lot last week. Uh, even after the injury Friday night dancing, he was still 
going to be in a limited emergency role only uh, for Florida. Uh, so, you know, Dan Mullen did say he's fine. Got cleared to practice on Thursday for the concussion. So he only practiced Thursday. Then he got hurt his knee on Friday night. Did some treatment all day Saturday, but was fine to go play. Could have played Saturday, but not having practice, coming off a concussion. And with that, he was going to be emergency use only. He was gimping around earlier today, so we'll see. So, of course, Will, I, I did have people send me that the MRI didn't come back very or, – or I won't necessarily say MRI. Whatever, whatever um, look they gave Anthony Richardson did not look as good. Uh, Maybe an MCL injury uh, thrown in there. And then we get the tweet from Anthony Richardson earlier today of him – tweeting a, a gif of somebody breakdancing. So I think he probably heard a lot of the word that was going out there that he had injured himself. Uh, and then the word that was coming out that uh, it may be more serious than thought. I mean, he tweets out uh, a dancing gif there. Uh, so maybe all is good in the world of Anthony Richardson and an injury here, but we'll I mean, dating back to his high school time, uh, missing time with an injury, his senior year, and now the hamstring issue that has you know, lingered from spring, luckily, has not come back up since uh, the, the USF game and him and getting back into the lineup. You know, concussion, not really necessarily a fault of his either. It uh, just happened. And now this, uh, I guess, somewhat crazy dancing injury that uh, he, he had Friday night. Hopefully all is good here, but uh, something to keep an eye on. Yeah, well, it is interesting. I mean, beyond just the injuries – you know, staying on the field has been a struggle. The helmet popping off on a few drives yeah. in the first couple of games. Then you have the hamstring injury. Then he comes back. He hurt his hand against LSU when he came into that one, which is why Emory oh, yeah. Jones had to come in and make the uh, make the pass that sort of kept that one drive alive. Um, and and now and then the concussion and now this. I mean, at some point we're going to start wondering whether we need to nickname him Mister Glass or something after all the injuries <laughs> he's having. But look, I, I think at the end of the day, when you're when you're a highly tuned athlete. Um, you got to take care of yourself. And that's one of the things yeah. you learn as you get older. Um, it's one of those things where I think when you talk to athletes, I got a buddy who played pretty high level baseball, um, you know, just barely made it to the majors. And and the thing that he learned as he got older that he wished he knew when he was 20 was how to actually take care of himself, take care of his body and make sure he was ready to go. And that's one of the things that you learn, right? So he's a red shirt freshman. He's out there break dancing. I guarantee you he's done this move a thousand different times yeah. and you do it one time and it tweaks. Right. And then it sounds stupid. You injured yourself dancing. But at the end of the day, when you're an 18, 19, 20 year old kid, did you ever do anything stupid? Did I ever do anything stupid? I can guarantee I did stuff stupid. There's probably a record of some things I did at the university yep. of Florida when I was 17, 18, 19 <laughs> years old. I'm pretty sure the student honor committee might have a record of, of, of a hearing or two. So <laughs> yeah, the, the reality is we all do some things that we wished we hadn't. Hopefully you learn from them. Hopefully as an athlete, you learn that the, that the, the, the body's the only one you have. I mean, I'm somebody who blew out my knee and it's, you know, the surgeons did wonders on it and it doesn't bother me all the time, but it still bothers me sometimes, right? I am not the same as I was before that injury. And so hopefully that this is an inexpensive lesson. That's one of the things my buddy talks about praying for his kids for inexpensive lessons. Same thing for these players, right? An inexpensive lesson. Hopefully it doesn't turn out to be anything all that serious. You know, it's something that a week later, you know, everything's healed up. You're all good. And you go, okay, we'll, uh, we'll leave the break dancing to our buddies and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and just sip on the, uh, sip, sip from the solo cup while you're watching the other people break dance. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. All right. There we wrapped it up there as quick as we could. You know, for, for, uh, there's plenty more to talk about. We could have went even longer with a lot of this stuff, but kind of fit it in the hour for a lot of you guys out there. Will read reaction coming up. Samford, uh, no. Uh, I'm not doing a Sanford preview this week. Um, I'm sure you probably won't either. Of course, a lot, a lot of it will be what do we want to see from Florida. It just doesn't matter who they're playing uh, with all these changes going on uh, for, for, for the Gators. So what you got coming up this week? Yeah, we'll be taking a look at the – so I've talked a lot about process tonight. I've been thinking about that for the for the last couple of days, and I, I want to talk about that. So I'm going to have a couple of articles up there about process in terms of how you select a defensive coordinator or what I think you should look at when you're trying to select a defensive coordinator and potentially what you would look at – You know, changing head coaches is not without risk. And so mm -hmm. one of the things I've been doing over the last couple of weeks is looking at – 
schools that have made head coaching changes and the profiles of those guys who have been successful, because I think that sort of infers in many case, in many ways, whether you'd want to make a change or not, and also sort of infers who you'd want to look at and who you'd want to dismiss. You know, the funny part is Nick made a great point on the stand up and holler last night about Lane Kiffin. He's like, wait, so you want a guy who's a little bit awkward, says things that you wouldn't want to say at press conferences <laughs> is an offensive savant and has a defense that struggles all the time. Huh? Where are we going to get one of those guys? Uh huh. <laughs> and so you know, I mean, it's interesting, right? Is how do you make yep. those decisions, and and what processes sh should go into that thinking, or the types of things I'm going to hopefully be dealing with this week a little bit. Sounds good. You can find it at readreaction.com, read reaction YouTube, stand up and hollows there, and uh, Will on Twitter at Will Miles S E C. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore S E C. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode 